So with decay kinetics and dating, one of the big topics that com commonly comes up is carbon dating. And um, we talked yesterday about some rocks and dating different parts of the earth and all, even dating meteorites and how do we figure out how old like rocks and stuff are. But what about things that were alive at some point and no longer are? Um, these are not easy to date with the same kinds of chronometers as we would use for the rocks. So for the rocks, we're looking for things that have, were constant over time um, in terms of, not constant over time, that were always present in the earth and that the decay of them kind of resets every time those rocks are melted and recrystallized. But if we're trying to date things that were alive, they were, they're typically closer in time to where we are now. And so we can't use like the uranium lead system because one for one, we don't, our bodies don't incorporate a lot of uranium to begin with. Um, so that makes it trickier to try to date people or bones or matter like that. But it's also on a much shorter time scale in terms of the decay. So you don't get as much change in the amount of uranium in uh, materials that come from living organisms. And so carbon-14 matches this much better. So we're going to talk a little bit about radiocarbon dating, how the carbon-14 is made, the assumptions that go into radiocarbon dating, because they are a little bit different. Um, they're different and similar to the ones with the rocks. Some of the key equations and the conventions that are used, and then just a couple of quick case studies so that we can see the kinds of things you can apply carbon-14 dating to. And so uh, carbon-14 was a pretty big discovery, the radiocarbon dating method. Uh, Willard Libby received the 1960 Nobel Prize in chemistry for doing this. And um, it's applied in all branches of science, archaeology, geology, geophysics, biology. And um, it's because carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere. So unlike the uranium-238 that would have been uh, included and incorporated into the Earth when the Earth formed, carbon-14 is constantly being produced in the atmosphere. And carbon gets incorporated into all living organisms and even some non-living or uh, non-living material as well, like precipitates in the ocean. And because living organisms are constantly bringing in carbon, their carbon-14 amounts are in equilibrium with the atmosphere until the organism dies. So then that's when the clock starts for us to be able to date something that was alive. That carbon-14 then decays away. We can look at the ratio of carbon-14 to the total carbon. And currently with um, accelerator mass spectrometry, we can date things up to about 75,000 years. If you use radiation detection methods like Geiger counters or uh, liquid scintillation counting, which are some of the techniques we'll talk a little bit about more later in the week, those initial applications or when carbon-14 dating was initially applied, they were pretty much limited to 30,000 years in terms of age because of the uncertainty with the counts. So where does the carbon-14 come from? Well, we have cosmic rays that are impacting the Earth. We also have particles coming from the sun through the solar wind. Uh, the cosmic rays are primarily, primarily high energy protons. Those collisions of those protons within the atmosphere produce secondary particles or cascades, and neutrons can be some of those secondary particles. So if we have slow neutrons impacting nitrogen-14, there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Does anybody know how much of the atmosphere approximately is nitrogen? You know, like 71 about 70 percent yeah so that's a lot so it's pretty likely that you can have neutrons colliding with nitrogen and if those neutrons are considered slow this is typically um, less than a thousand electron volts in energy then those neutrons are able to produce carbon-14 for higher energy neutrons or fast neutrons they um, don't produce the carbon-14. They cause tritium to get kicked out, and you go from nitrogen-14 to carbon-12. Of course, in the atmosphere, we've got oxygen around as well. So that carbon, that carbon-14 that's produced eventually undergoes oxidation. 
And that CO2 then gets incorporated into plants and other material around based off of reactions in equilibrium with carbon dioxide. So some of the assumptions that um, get used, and we can poke holes in these, but this is kind of the starting point for doing carbon dating, is that the carbon-14 concentration in the troposphere, so the first 10 kilometers of the atmosphere, is the same everywhere. The concentration is constant. Even though we know that production rate increases with the geomagnetic latitude and with altitude in the atmosphere itself. The other assumption is that the initial carbon-14 activity in organic matter has remained constant everywhere on the surface of the Earth for the past 70,000 years. So everything in the organic matter that's taking up carbon takes it up at the same rate, has the same equilibrium with the atmosphere. We're going to poke holes in that later, but that's one of the assumptions. The specific activity of carbon-14 in plants does not depend on environmental factors. So you can go between different plants, you can go between different temperatures, different amounts of rainfall, and you're always gonna see the same amount of carbon-14 in the plants. And the final assumption is that, or sorry, not assumption, those are the three assumptions, but of course we know that the sun has different amounts of activity. We, maybe you know there's an 11-year cycle to sunspots. And so you have different amounts of solar activity that's gonna change carbon-14 production. The solar wind is gonna carry different amounts of particles over time as that solar activity changes. We know Earth's magnetic field has fluctuated in the past. That's going to affect how the uh, cosmic rays interact with the atmosphere and how charged particles coming in interact with the atmosphere. And you might be saying, well, carbon-14 production only depends on neutrons, but if you have charged particles in, impacting within the atmosphere, that affects how many of those neutrons you can produce. Of course, we've had nuclear weapons that have also increased the neutron flux in the atmosphere, nuclear power, and the Seuss effect. And we'll get into some of that stuff on other slides. So even though those, these are the assumptions, we know there's issues with those. And so we'll have to talk about a little bit about some of the corrections that get applied. So thinking back to biology, and how carbon gets into living organisms. Uh, this was not my favorite class, biology, but um, the Calvin cycle is how carbon dioxide gets fixed into sugars within plants. And so this um, happens within chlorophyll containing producers, whether they're chloroplasts or cyanobacteria. And um, Part of the, the cycle where this uh, CO2 is getting fixed is it's making use of the NADPH, it's making use of ATP to drive this fixation of carbon into sugars. And the triose phosphate um, has two different isomers in solution. Um, so there's two forms for that. And Rubisco, is the main enzyme that does this fixing in the Calvin cycle. And so somebody on Wikipedia, Wikimedia was nice enough to have this Calvin cycle diagram that I really liked. So I'm giving them attribution. <laughs> um, and if you like the crash course videos, I don't know, I always thought they were a little comical. There is a fun segment in one of the crash course videos on biology on Rubisco and how it is the enzyme that is the most abundant on the earth because of, because of all the plants. So plants fix carbon, that carbon gets incorporated into sugars. Of course, we don't breathe in carbon dioxide ourselves, but we eat things that have sugars. We eat plants, we eat animals sometimes. And so we're incorporating that carbon-14 into our bodies that was itself made by plants. And so we are also considered to be in equilibrium with the carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Now there's a few conventions that are used when people talk about carbon-14 dates. Um, they've stuck with the values from Libby, even though those values have been uh, nailed down a little bit more accurately since his time. So the half-life for carbon-14 that we use for carbon-14 dating is a little bit different. Um, so the decay constant's a little bit different. What this means is that Libby dates are a little bit lower than the actual dates. So Libby dates sometimes make, make, make objects and materials seem to be a little bit younger than they really are. 
The conventional dates are always expressed in years before present, where present is taken as 1950. So you can convert to calendar years by just subtracting 1950 from the before present dates. Positive values would actually be before the common era. Negative values would be in the common era. Like, so this is like BC AD. And we do have to correct based off of dendrochronology that's looking at tree rings. So we do know that there's been different amounts of carbon-14 production, even though it's relatively constant, there are enough fluctuations where that can change uh, the age that something is based on how we measure it. And of course, if we're looking at carbon, whether we're looking at carbon-12 and carbon-13 versus carbon-14, because those have different masses, there is mass fractionation. So perhaps you recall talking about the isotope effect in biology and uh, organic chemistry with deuterium versus hydrogen and how there's an effect there based off of mass. And this happens all the time, whether it's geologically in minerals or whether it's in living things, there's mass fractionation. And there's gonna be small differences in how organisms take up carbon-14 versus carbon-12. And so we put together big overall calibration curves to do this. One of the reasons why we're looking at calibration curves with these and why it's kind of important to understand how the carbon-14 is decaying is because it's decaying to nitrogen-14. And nitrogen commonly forms like a gas. And so it's going to be really hard to sequester nitrogen um, in those materials that come from living things. And if it's a stable thing, the nitrogen-14, it's hard to detect how much nitrogen-14 came from carbon-14 versus how much is already present. So um, a lot of instrumental techniques you can use to detect atoms and specific atoms, but there's just so much nitrogen around, how would you know what came from the living thing versus what's just there because of your instrumental technique? And so when we look at dendrochronology, we can look at trees, we can count rings, we can know exactly based off of the tree rings how old they are. We can find the amounts of carbon-14 in those rings. We can match up different trees from different times. So think of it like a puzzle where a slight part of that puzzle overlaps. And so we can build out our dendrochronology graphs by using those overlaps that match up. And so over the past 6,000 years or so, we can get pretty good correction factors of carbon-14 dates based off of tree rings. So over the past uh, 3,000 years or so, we've been pretty close to zero in terms of that correction. But for the 3,000 years before that, so from 1,000 to 5,000-ish in terms of before common era, um, we do have to add time on to correct those dates, to correct those ages, okay? Um, looking more recently over the past 100 years or so, we can focus down in on some specific tree ring dates. And what we see is there should be a straight line between the radiocarbon dates and the actual dates. But the carbon-14 amount fluctuates over time in the atmosphere. So on that one graph, there's something called the Maunder minimum around 1700 years, 1700, and that was because of decreased sunspot activity. Decreased sunspot spot activity meant that the, there was a higher production rate, relative rate of the slow neutrons versus the fast neutrons. Because there were more slow neutrons, that means there was more carbon-14. If there's more carbon-14 in the sample now when we look at it, that makes it seem like the sample is younger than it really is. So that's the Maunder minimum on this correction graph. The other big deviation we see there is the Seuss effect. This is not the Seuss from like the Lorax, but it is kind of funny because it is the result of increased combustion of fossil fuels. So if you think about a fossil fuel that comes from something that's been dead for millions of years, that dead carbon is extremely depleted in carbon-14. So when we burn those fuels and put that carbon back into the atmosphere, we're diluting the amount of carbon-14 that's still in the atmosphere. So that makes it look like things that were formed over the past 100, 150 years, that makes it look like those things are actually older than they really are because there's a lower ratio of carbon-14 
to the total carbon. One of the reasons why we typically only talk about carbon dating pre-1950, does anybody have any ideas what started happening happening around 1950, just after 1950? Industrial era? era? Say it again, Harris. The industrial era, or is that too late? That's kind of the Seuss effect. So that's like the industrial revolution and the burning of fossil fuels. What else was going on around 1950? Uh, nuclear testing. Nuclear testing, especially thermonuclear weapons. So IB Mike, for instance, was detonated November 1st, 1952 in the Pacific Ocean. It was the first full test of what's called the Teller Ulam design, which is a staged fusion device, which uses a fission bomb to actually start off the fusion to increase the yield from the nuclear weapon. That also increases the amount of nitrogen that goes into the atmosphere, uh, nitrogen neutrons. So that's affecting the amount of carbon-14 production. And that has huge effects on dating anything that's more recent. Uh, let me pause here and make sure there's no questions so far. Or see what questions there are. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Could you just explain the Seuss effect one more time? The Seuss effect uh, comes from burning of the fossil fuels. The fossil fuels are depleted in the carbon-14. Basically, there is no carbon-14 left. And so when those fossil fuels get burned, there's a lot more carbon-12, carbon-13 going into the atmosphere. That dilutes the amount of carbon-14 that's in the atmosphere. So when things then incorporate that CO2 that's in the atmosphere, that CO2 in the atmosphere has less carbon-14 than it should compared to the dates based off of carbon-14. And so when we date things over the past 150 years, they actually appear to be older than they really are because of the burning of the fossil fuels, okay? So fossil fuels, things coming from oil, petroleum-based products, no matter what they are, are gonna be depleted in carbon-14. And that's always gonna make analyses of those materials, make them seem like they're older. I mean, for the fossil fuels, they are older. But if you're mixing fossil fuels in with something more recent, that can change the apparent age. Anything else? The what? You said that the um, Maunder minimum creates less or more neutrons from the uh, sunspot activity. So the sunspot activity, because it's lower, I think there are, I think the uh, solar wind, I think it's lower energy particles, which then are more likely to create slow neutrons. And because you're creating more slow neutrons, you're producing more carbon-14. And so you have more of that parent around. And so if you have more of the parent around, it's gonna make it look like less of it has decayed. And if it looks like less has decayed, then it makes it look like it's younger than it really is. So monitor minimum there is based off of sunspots. Seuss effect is based off of industrial revolution and burning of fossil fuels. So a little bit more recent than like say steam engine stuff. So these are the corrections with the tree rings. We need to do some corrections as well for isotope fractionation. So that's what some of these correction equations look like. The correction that delta there for the carbon 13. So this is a correction um, just for mass fractionation or the isotope effect. And it's expressed in what's called per mil, which kind of looks like a percent, but it's per thousand instead of per hundred. And so uh, we can look at a standard and pick a standard and the next slide is gonna talk about what that standard is. But compared to the standard, typical wood, just from a generic tree, is actually depleted in carbon-13 by about 25 parts per thousand. And we look at this correction factor with the carbon-13 versus the carbon-12 so that we can, um, Oh, thanks, I'm just seeing some of the chat stuff now. And the XKCD comics are always classic. I'll look at those in a second. Um, because we're looking at carbon-13 versus carbon-12 here, if we wanted to apply this to carbon-14, 
the effect is going to be twice as large for carbon-14 as it would be for carbon-13. So that's why in that final equation there, what we have is we have a corrected activity equals the measured activity. And within that uh, factor that you multiply the measured activity by, you have that um, depletion or enrichment factor, that delta in there for the carbon-13 compared to the standard. So the standard is actually based off of what's called a, the PD bellum night. I thought I saw somebody else, one of the students was from North Carolina or lives in North Carolina. Yeah, I used to live like right on the, like right around PD. Um, and then Winston-Salem, the city there, that's where my university is. Okay, so this is a big, uh, river tributary system, um, at least relatively on the East Coast. Of course, there's tons of rivers on the East Coast. But this uh, sedimentary formation that lies along the PD River um, trapped with sediments these squid-like creatures called bellumnites. And they had internal skeletons. And these are, I don't know why, don't ask me why they chose these, but um, these are what were chosen as the standard for determining these carbon-13 mass fractionation numbers. Um, and so there's the, the map of the river, there's a picture of what they think these looked like um, based off of the skeletons that could be recovered. So just as an example, some of these corrections here, um, you've got organic matter, so plants and things and trees, um, different types of plants. So C3 versus C4, these are like different types of cycles. That's biology, don't ask me too much about that. Um, and uh, you see they're all relatively about between say 20 and 30 parts per mil. And they're negative, which means they're depleted. So they take up less carbon-14 from the atmosphere than there actually is in the atmosphere. And then we have carbonate materials. And because the plants on land take up less carbon-14, there's actually more carbon-14 in the ocean, in the water, dissolved in the water, than there would be kind of as our overall carbon-14 pool. And so that actually raises some of the um, depletion factors or correction factors for these uh, marine organisms. And so whether they came from um, marine fossils or corals, there's different factors in there. And some of the ones that come from precipitations, where it's been a precipitate, you can see there's even a few positive deltas in there where they're actually enriched in the carbon-14, okay? Um, if we put all this together, if we put together the tree rings, if we put together these, these deltas and think about doing conventional ages versus calendar ages, we get big uh, correction graphs like this or calibration curves. Um, see, it doesn't follow that one-to-one -line, one -one line perfectly. Um, that's because of the variations over time in all the things that impact the carbon-14, not just the mass fractionation, although that's a little bit in here too. Um, and you can look and see the papers and the specimens and where they got these different uh, corrections from. The green line for the tree rings is relatively small on the graph. It is pretty much only in this re region here. So that's about as far back as we can get with tree rings. All this other stuff comes from other fossils and dating the layers of rock where we found the fossils to help us figure out what the age of the fossils were and then incorporating that carbon-13, carbon-14 information into our ages. So when you look at this and when you blow up a specific section of the calibration curve and the um, axes are gonna flip a little bit, this is going in our traditional positive-positive when we flip the axes, really kind of what we're looking at here on the x-axis is years in the past. And the closer we get to the current time, the further to the right it goes. So if we zoom in on a part of that calibration curve, we kind of have this envelope based off of uncertainties. And where that envelope is very, uh, very steep, we have a nice um, 
small range of uncertainty. We have our measured radiocarbon with that um, Gaussian distribution, Poisson distribution for the uh, counting statistics and for the age. And then we have the um, calibrated age on the x-axis. And depending on what you're willing to go to in terms of probability or confidence intervals, you get a, a different range of dates for that calibrated date. And so for things that are, you know, about 2,400 years old, this particular pot part of the calibration curve is good. If we look at another example, we see there's a little bit of overlap here. It's not as sharp of a slope for our calibration curve. And so what happens sometimes is you get two peaks for your calibrated age. And you kind of have to think about what's the area, what's the probability. Um, these are kind of like our, our probabilities up here for those two age ranges. And you can put those together to get an overall mean. So for kind of old stuff, this is what happens sometimes. And it just depends on where you are with the correction. So the carbon-14 fluctuates a little bit over time. If you're unlucky enough where you have a measurement right here, you'd have like two equal sized peaks, but then you kind of have to think, is it really that important? Whether it's 19,700 years old or 19,600 years old, you know? So you have to think about what you're trying to apply it to. And so we'll look at a couple case studies now um, after I take questions and we'll see how some of these things that it gets applied to do matter in terms of the age we date things to. Any questions at this point? This is basically the theory, and then we're gonna just see some fun examples. Yeah, uh, what's the x-axis on this graph? This one is also, um, this is eight uh, years in the past. So again, as you go further to the right, you get closer to the current time. Got it, thank you. Yeah versus this one, which is actually looking at like the age. How old is it? These are looking at, well, not how old is it, but when was it formed? How many years in the past? Yeah, never mind. They're both the same. It's just flipping the axes direction. So I talk myself out of stuff like that. I just have a quick question too. Um, if you go back to the slide with the graph, is the y-axis the adjusted um, radiocarbon age based off of all of those factors we talked about before? Um, the calibration curve itself is including a lot of those. And so um, the conventional age would be what you would measure and the calendar age would be the actual age. And the points on here, based off of the different kinds of samples that you have, those points are, have already been corrected for like the isotope fractionation. There's, and there's different ways that you could do it too. So you could include it here with this calibration. You could include it when you measure and determine the corrected activity. And then that corrected activity you work back through the half-life equation for. So a couple maps, just to kind of show you where some of these samples that we're gonna talk about have come from. Some of the other maps are on some of the other slides. So we can look at charcoal. Charcoal's kind of cool. It tells us when people started to gather and when we were starting to cook food. Um, coprolites are actually fossilized feces that can tell us when people moved into different areas. That study is kind of interesting because they also use DNA to determine that they actually came from people, to look at migrations of people. We can look at seeds and date seeds, and that's interesting because it can tell us about when agriculture started. And we can also look at other artifacts or um, scams, if you like, to determine how authentic they are. And so the Shroud of Turin, the Vinland map, and the Voynich manuscript are some more recent things. 
seems like every couple of months there's a new article that pops up about the Voynich manuscript somebody who thinks they finally decoded it. So the charcoal um, was found in a cave in Spain when they analyzed these samples to do this with the carbon-14 dating they removed the root hairs so some plants had grown over top of the charcoal they were, they were trying to make sure they only had the charcoal material they leached material out from the charcoal with dilute hydrochloric acid and then uh, readjusted pH with sodium hydroxide and we're just trying to make sure they had no more recently retained living matter or minerals still around. They took five milligram samples from each of the charcoal pieces and from all of those samples, they were able to find an age of about 38.7 plus or minus 1.9 thousand years before present. So then again, remember you would uh, basically subtract that from 1950 and to get your actual age. So they dated these samples to 36,750 BCE. So this means that people were creating fires 38,000 years in the past. Um, the 39.6 plus or minus 1.5 thousand years before present was a paper done in 1994 and by a different research group and that just agreed with the earlier measurement. So that's kind of cool for the charcoal. So that tells us when people were first starting to build fires, at least for material that we can still find and that is still pure enough where we can do dating. Uh, the Paisley Caves in Oregon, this is a big cave complex. Um, they found the coprolites or the fossilized feces there. The group who did this research, they took six samples from those coprolites. They looked for single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are like little, uh, these are when you've got a single nucleotide and a DNA chain that has uh, had a mutation occur to it. And that then gets carried through like a population of people. These particular SNPs were associated with North American populations. And you can look at these with mitochondrial DNA because we get our mitochondria from our mothers. And so you can track back through the maternal um, genetic chains. When they, so they were able to determine one, that these feces came from people uh, because there were feces mixed into the area that came from like foxes. Um, so they wanted to make sure they only got the, the human ones. And they took five of those six that were carbon-14 dated. Four were older than 10,000 years before present, and three of the samples were actually greater than 12,000 years before present. So it looks like people had used these caves at different points in time. What they were trying to find was they were trying to find the oldest um, samples in these caves that they could find that were coming from humans. The Clovis humans are when people kind of used to think that humans first came into North America. They used to think that was around 11,000 years before present. Um, but these carbon-14 dated samples, the ones that were over 12,000 years old, showed that there were actually pre-Clovis humans in these Paisley caves by around 12,300 years before present. So this affects our understanding of how humans migrate around the earth and where we all came from and how, how people moved and that land bridge between Russia and North America. And of course, the, for these people to get to the Paisley Caves in Oregon, they would have had to have come down through Alaska. So it would have taken time to migrate that way. Uh, we can look at the start of agriculture and we can look at how uh, cereal grains were developed and where where they were used and how old they were and so there were some cereal grains found in containers in Jericho in Israel and they were dated to about 10,000 years before present by a research study in 1969. We've looked at other grains in Europe and those were from around 6,400 BCE and that was from a paper in 1998. And so we can look at cereal grains from different places around the earth and we can use those to tra track the, de the development or the spread of agriculture. So these are kinds of some natural 
history things, root hair, did I explain that one? So roots from plants, but they're the tiny, tiny roots that kind of look like cobwebs almost, but okay. Um, any questions about kind of like the natural history samples? Okay, so uh, the Shroud of Turin. This is a linen cloth that bears the image of a man. It's typical of a burial shroud, and it's kept in the chapel of the Holy Shroud in Turin, Italy. That's like in the northwestern part of Italy, if I remember that map correctly. There are many different possible methods that you could use to transfer images to cloth. Uh, there was a local bishop who wrote in 1390 that the shroud was a forgery and an unnamed artist had actually confessed to its creation. But of course, a lot of people think that this is a holy artifact and um, there's been debates over whether it's authentic or not. Some people think that it's the burial shroud from Jesus. About the church allowed radiocarbon dating to occur on a corner of the shroud. And there were three samples that were sent out to three different labs. Oxford, University of Arizona, and a Swiss Institute of Technology. And with 95, within 95% 95 confidence, the shroud, the material, the linen itself, was dated to between 1260 and 1390 AD. So it looks like it was indeed a forgery. It was material that um, was from someone who was buried more recently than when Jesus would have been buried. So that's the Shroud of Turin. The next one, there's like a whole Nova episode on. Uh, I'm gonna check on the quota we have for our Canvas course and I will try to upload, upload a rip of that DVD, we'll see. Um, I believe that would be fair use since it's kind of like an out of print DVD and you can't really access it on the PBS website um, and it would be for educational purposes. Um, so this is what the Vinland map looks like. It was purported to show that Vikings had discovered North America well before Christopher Columbus um, because of the coastline of Greenland and the coastline of basically like Canada and Newfoundland and New Labrador. And uh, it was found bound inside of, so how many people have seen like the hard, a hardback book and it's got the paper cover on the inside there? Well, when they bound old books, a lot of times they would put other papers there um, to help pad it a little bit. And they found this bound in a book called The Tartar Relation, which was like an old novel or whatever that somebody had written. And somebody tried to sell this unsuccessfully to the British Museum. Somebody else was duped into buying it for $3,500 and then offered it to Yale. Um, when they had the map and the book, there were wormholes in both. So there are worms and other beings that can bore through papers and eat paper and the wormholes didn't match up. So they had some suspicion that this uh, Vinland map had not always been in this book and that it may not have been authentic because of that. But in the spring of 1958, there were other books acquired by this guy Thomas Marston. And when you stack those books together in the right order, then the wormholes did match. So that was kind of the missing piece. So these materials did, were all bound together at some point in history. Um, this guy, Lawrence Witten, was able to convince Paul Mellon to buy the map for $300,000. So this is like 1958, that's a lot of money. And uh, he donated it to Yale to investigate. And the map and the accompanying book themselves were revealed in 1965. Um, the accompanying book that went along with this big reveal, they like revealed this all on Columbus Day. So it was kind of interesting reading about and learning about the history of here. You know, everybody, the Italians especially, like to say that Columbus discovered America. So here they were on Columbus Day saying, no, you're wrong, and the Vikings discovered it. The book authors um, who wrote this accompanying book, who did the analysis of the map, were these three people. And only Skelton, the keeper of the British Museum's map collection, 
had enough significant expertise relevant to the problems posed by the map to do the analysis. The book was never peer reviewed and immediately after publication it incited controversy, probably because they published it on Columbus Day. Um, the Smithsonian Institution held a Vinland map conference in 1966 where scientists got together and discussed possible problems with the map, including things like the cartography, the written language on the map, the inks, the parchment. So the NOVA episode goes into all the different kinds of science analysis that they did for the Vinland map. But uh, Garmin Harbottle, who was at Brookhaven National Lab, he used to give a special topics talk on this, which was always hilarious. He did the radiocarbon dating with the group um, from Yale. The initial dates that they found though were based on material from the Vinland map that contained fallout particles. So that remember that can skew the ages that you would determine. So they went through some processes to clear the parchment, clear the varnish off, whatever there was on the, on the paper. And they dated the paper itself to 1423 to 1445. Other people since then have looked at things like the ink, uh, where it was not conventional iron gall ink as would have been used back then. The parchment was coated with some sort of an unknown substance or a varnish. There was double outlining, which they thought may have been done as a forgery to try and make it look like it was older. The fold for the map or whatever was too convenient where the fold was. Um, and the ink, when they analyzed the ink, they found that it contained titanium dioxide particles, which wasn't used in inks until the 1920s. So it looks like it was a more recent, recent forgery. Um, unfortunately, and as they get into in the Nova episode, the original holder of the map, this guy Ferrajoli, was convicted of theft of manuscripts from the Cathedral Library in Liceo, Zaragoza, and he died shortly after he was released from prison. So we can't go back to him and interview him to find out if it was a hoax. Um, if we were physically present in person, I'd have the DVD and you could sign it out this week. It is kind of interesting. It's like a classic mystery and how do you find out whether it's real or not? The what, is the, what is the benefit of creating these forgeries? Like what does it do for people? I guess besides the whole money aspect, but like yeah, what does it accomplish you, if you don't get the money? hundred thousand dollars off of it. So um, <laughs> just money. Some, you know, these people were probably crooks and um, don't want to disparage anybody, but they were probably crooks trying to make a quick buck. And Yale and this guy, Paul Mellon, unfortunately were duped and they were taken in. So um, the final answer they arrived at was that the paper was indeed authentic, but that it had a newly drawn bad copy of an authentic 1430s map, the Bianco world map, with several attempts to disguise the forgery, including a newer varnish of the parchment. So yeah, people make stuff like this to try to make money. Um, it's Sometimes people do it and they get into this a little bit in the NOVA program. Sometimes people do it kind of like as a thought experiment. Like, could I make something that would appear to be authentic where I could fool people? You know, I can forge something but make it look real. Um, so Yale struck out with the Vinland map. Could they hit a home run with another document? So here's the Voynich manuscript. And I'll show you pictures on the next slide. Um, yeah, Lewis's comment is good. Uh, Garmin Harbottle did think the map was authentic. So, <laughs> and we could go probably go back and forth on it, whether it was, yeah, we could go back and forth over how authentic it was. Uh, you can watch the Nova episode. Uh, there might be newer research on it out there too, if you're interested in figuring that out. With this uh, Voynich manuscript thing, this um, bishop in Prague, Georg Barish in Prague, or bishop, bishop, maybe he was just a private citizen, he wrote a letter in 1639 saying that this sphinx, this book, had been taking up space uselessly in his library. The manuscript is known for Wilfred Voynich, who was a book dealer who purchased it in 1912. In 1969, it was donated to Yale. It's an illustrated codex handwritten in an unknown writing system. There are some pages missing. There are 240 remaining. 112 of the pages 
relate to herbs, 21 astronomical, et cetera. You can see all the different things there. Several of the pages also fold out. So here's some images of the book. The one on the top left there that's got, looks like it has like six sections. That's one of those fold out pages. And um, it appears in and it has inspired several more modern works of fiction, like mystery stories and stuff like that. In 2009, uh, the University of Arizona dated the manuscript to between 1404 and 1438. Because it has a more complete provenance, because there are documents showing that it was around um, in the past, here we have it from the 1600s, um, and the ink analysis in this case was positive for an authentic ink from that time. It is indeed thought to be an authentic work, but again, why do people make stuff like this? Some people think that somebody just made the book as a hoax, like that it might have been like a, a fake religion or something like that or whatever based on the herbs. So, um, yeah. I don't know, there might be a test question about how you could fool somebody with radiocarbon dating, so. Oh, you made the Voynich manuscript. I think there's another XKD, XKCD out there on this one too, so look for it and you might get some bonus points. Do you guys have any questions right now? I'm gonna pause the recording and um, So if you are having radiation interact with matter, that's how you have to have it to get it detected. When you think about the wind, how do you know there's wind? Well, you feel it interacting with your skin, right? How do you know that there's gravity? Well, you can see the effects of gravity on things in motion. How do you know if um, your sibling pushes you for your parents? How do, they, how do they know when your sibling or friend or something pushes you because they, they see the effect of the interaction, right? And so for us to detect matter, for us to detect radiation rather, it has to interact somehow with matter. And so there's different mechanisms for how these reactions occur. And we're gonna split up radiation into some types. And for each type, we're generally gonna talk about uh, how energy is lost, what's the stopping power, of matter for that type of radiation, what's the range, and then there's a few example problems of how we can actually do some, do some calculations. There's still some math here, but there's a lot less math than there is with the decay kinetics. And so when we split up types of radiation, anybody have any ideas for how we might categorize types of radiation? Particles and uh, high energy photons. That would be one good way. How could we split up the particles? By mass or charge? By mass or charge. And so typically what we do is we split things up into heavy and light. The heavy particles are the ones where the mass is significantly greater than the mass of an electron. And the light particles are the ones where their mass is about the same as an electron. And of course you're saying, well, wait a minute, gamma rays have no mass but their energy is comparable to the rest mass energy of electrons, okay? Um, we can also then split these up into charged and neutral. And so just thinking back to like radiation safety, what do you know about the relative ranges of each type of radiation? Uh, basically, the bigger it is and the slower it moves and the less distance it travels. So out of all these, out of these four things that are listed right now, so protons, neutrons, electrons, gamma rays, which ones are you going to need the least material to shield for? The, uh, charge, the, the heavy ions? Yeah, so the protons, the heavy ions. Heavy ions would be like alphas as well, okay? Um, Remember, those can be stopped by like paper or just your skin. Out of all these, which ones would you say you need the most material to shield for? Gamma. Gamma. Okay. So you kind of know this already from radiation safety stuff, 
we're going to talk a little bit more about why that's the, why that's true and get a little bit into some of the math behind these. So our starting point is going to be the heavy charged particles. These are going to be the easiest ones to think through. So just to kind of go a little bit heavier even than an alpha particle, let's just say we're looking at an oxygen 16 ion entering a material. Pretend you're that oxygen 16 ion. And as you move through matter, what are you going to see? What are you going to be influenced by around you? You're this big oxygen ion. You've got a positive charge. What can you interact with? The electron cloud? The electron clouds. And so the electrons are negative, right? Um, what's going to happen with those as this oxygen ion passes through the material? The electrons are going to be attracted, attracted to it. Um, but this oxygen 16 is, it's an ion, it's moving pretty quickly. It's not going to interact on a long time scale with those electrons. So it's going to disrupt those electrons. But every time that positive ion has an interaction with an electron, it's going to lose some energy, okay? And we are generally going to think about those as collisions, and we're going to think about those as collisions when we think about energy transfer, but they don't actually have to physically collide, okay? It's just those um, electric fields that are colliding or interacting as they move past each other. Now, just to kind of think ahead a little bit, how would that be different for an electron entering a material? They're repelled by the electron clouds instead of attracted? It'll still be, yeah, it'll still interact. It'll be repelled by the electron cloud instead of attracted. And think about mass here as well. So when the oxygen 16 ion interacts with an electron in the material, is that really going to change the oxygen 16 ion that much in terms of its direction or its energy? No. But an electron interacting with another electron, what could happen now? Scattering. It could what? Sorry? Scatter. Could scatter. And how about the energy transferred? So you have an electron and an electron. What could be true about that collision for energy transfer? It could transfer a lot of its energy to another electron, maybe? Yeah, it could transfer a lot of its energy. And because they're equal mass, it could actually transfer all of its energy. So you can exactly transfer between equal mass particles and collisions, OK? Is so, that the photoelectric effect, or is that not the same thing? That's getting ahead, because that would be gamma rays, OK? Ah, OK, gotcha. So this is just a think about an electron and electron. It's like a pool, two pool balls colliding, and the one's at rest, and the other's moving, right? And the one that's moving, the cue ball hits the one at rest, and then it transfers its energy completely. That's possible, okay? That's not going to happen in every collision. But what that means is that electrons could lose more interaction, more energy per interaction. Whereas charged ions, heavy charged particles, are going to only lose a fraction of their energy with each interaction. That means that heavy charged particles are going to create a lot more of these scattered electrons in a material. So recall from like general physics that you've got conservation of energy, you've got conservation of momentum and collisions. If only the impacting ion or impacting electron has energy, has velocity, then that's the total initial energy. That's the total initial momentum. The final momentum is going to be the momentum of the ion and any scattered electrons. And the same is going to be true for the energy. You can put these two equations together and you can solve for the maximum energy transferred, which is this four times the mass of an electron times the mass of your ion times the energy of the ion over the combined mass squared. And so if Capital M, if this is an electron, skipping to the last question, this equation simplifies. If our big M is the same as Me, the mass of an electron, then we end up with 8 MeE over 4 Me on the bottom. So we end up with, um, or not at 8 Me, 4 Me squared 
times the energy over 4me squared on the bottom. So we end up canceling out and we see that the maximum energy transferred for an electron is the full energy of the electron. But if we're looking at say a proton colliding with an electron, for any given proton, the maximum energy that can be transferred is only about 2000 times the mass of an electron. or sorry, the proton is about 2,000 times the mass of an electron, right? So what's the maximum energy that can be transferred when a proton collides with an electron? A very small amount. Yeah, it's about one five hundredth. So, when you plug that into your 4ME, capital ME over M plus ME squared, you get that delta E max. This equation is gonna come back up again when we look at some more of the math with um, what's called stopping power, okay? So for a proton, it's only gonna transfer about 1 500th of its energy with each interaction. That's the maximum energy it can possibly transfer. Whereas for an electron, an electron could transfer all of its energy in one single collision. It doesn't really do much for us in the long run in terms of how the detectors are gonna work. We want that electron to lose its energy a little bit more slowly. But this is gonna be the main difference between charged particles whether it's based off of their mass. If they're heavy, they only lose a small amount of their energy as they move through the material. So if we think about these ions, and we typically think about, say, alpha particles now, we have the oxygen as an example. At sufficiently high velocities, these ions are completely stripped of their electrons. So the alpha particle we typically think of as having a charge of two plus, and that's gonna be its charge for most of the time that it's moving through matter. It's because it's charged, because they're ions, they lose energy through electron excitation and ionization within the stopping material. So they're exciting ions in the surrounding atoms and they're ionizing atoms in the surrounding material as these ions, as these alpha particles move through the matter. When they get closer to the velocities of the K-shell electrons, so the inner shell electrons, then the iron, the ions start to pick up electrons themselves. So the alpha particle is gonna be two plus. It's gonna lose energy. At some point, it's gonna be moving slow enough where it can pick up one electron. When it picks up one electron, its charge goes down from two plus to one plus. And then by the time that these ions have slowed down enough where they're closer in speed to the valence shell electrons, then almost all of their energy is gonna be lost through elastic collisions, and they finally start to pick up the second electron that they still need and become neutral, and then at that point, they're not really interacting with the matter anymore. They're not really considered to be like a radiation particle anymore. Especially for an alpha, by that point where it's picked up two electrons, we would just consider it to be a high energy helium atom. And then it's just gonna kind of act like a gas. So we see there's kind of a mass effect here. And the mass effect is that um, these particles all have the same initial energy per nucleon. So they all started with about 10 MeV of energy per nucleon. And as they passed through a photographic plate, they interacted. They created electron pairs within the emulsion and that's what caused the exposure or the track that we can see. Notice how straight in general these lines are. So these ions, they're, whether they're alphas or whether they're any of these other ones that are shown here or whether they're protons, they're pretty much moving in a straight line. Now what's really nice with this, you see it a lot with this, um, 
Argon 40. I think that was a typo in the original figure. The track there at the end, this is where the particle stops, where I highlighted. The track gets a lot thicker, and it's getting thicker, indicating more exposure because there are more ion pairs produced there. Because that ion is slowed down enough that it's actually depositing more of its energy at the end of its track. Okay. And so for all of these in the same kind of material, an alpha particle would pass the, the, the longest distance, but we can see as this mass number goes up, even though we're putting more energy into these particles, they end up having shorter tracks because they're heavier, okay? Because they're larger. So just to start to get into a couple of the calculations, and think about how fast these things really are moving. Let's take this energy alpha particle and go ahead and calculate the Newtonian velocity of it. So how would you calculate velocity when you know the energy? E equals mc squared. Uh, that's True, but that would be Not for these. converting the matter to energy. Think about, you know, the kinetic energy of this particle. How do you calculate its speed? Kinetic half mv squared. One half mv squared. And if you're using MeV, you can convert MeV to joules. Once you're in joules, then you can convert the AMU for the alpha particle into kilograms. If you need them, there's the two conversions you can use between MeV and joules. And you can see at the bottom there my work for this. And that the Newtonian velocity for this alpha particle would be about 1.9 or 19 million meters per second. 1.9 times 10 to the seventh meters per second for the Newtonian velocity. You could keep a few more. significant figures there, if you like. But that's not super close to the speed of light, at least, okay? Now, one of the other things we need to do or think about is how does that compare to the speed of light? And what would the relativistic velocity be? This comes up in a lot of these calculations with determining energy transfer. So here's the equation for relativistic velocity, where the relativistic velocity V equals the speed of light times the square root of this term. And in this term, the values you want to use, the mc squared can be the mass in MeV of the particle. And so you may recall, uh, I think uh, Cody gave that to you guys last week. And I'll show my work in a minute, but I have 3,727.3794. 
MeV per C squared as the mass of the alpha particle. So that MC squared, you would use the mass of the particle in MeV, and the Ke would be the kinetic energy of the particle. So in this case for the alpha, that's the 7.6868 MeV. While you're calculating that V, that relativistic velocity, that's the actual velocity when you take relativity into a account. The other way to think about relativistic velocities is to compare them to the speed of light. So this, this beta term is the relative velocity. It's the velocity relative to the speed of light for that particle. And so that equation that's shown there, the V equals C times the square root, if you just divide V by C, in other words, just take the square root, that would be the beta. So while you're can working- you, Can you explain that again, sorry? The, everything under the square root, the one minus MC squared over KE plus MC squared squared, that whole term under the square root is the same thing as the beta, okay? So if you pause there, that's beta. And then when you multiply beta by the speed of light, then that gives you the relativistic velocity. So you should be getting, let me slide this down so I don't show the electron too soon. You should be getting Still about 1.9, so 1.9224 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. That would be the relativistic velocity. Notice it's not that different from the Newtonian velocity, okay? So for alpha particles, this is a typical energy that you might see from alpha decay. You do see some alphas that go up to around 10 MeV, but for this magnitude of energy, we don't normally have to worry about relativistic velocities, okay? Because they're so close to the Newtonian velocity. But the terms are the, the relativistic velocities are the ones that get incorporated into the equations. And the beta, the fraction of the speed of light here is 0 0.0641. So the alpha particle is only moving about 6% of the speed of light. You don't typically start worrying about relativistic velocities until they're moving more than say 10% of the speed of light. So that's all for an alpha particle. How is this gonna be different? Oh. How uh, is what did you use for the mass term in that equation again? Like what was the 3,727? The mc squared, that's the mass of the alpha particle in MeV. Thank you. Yeah, and I just happened to catch Dr. Folden's talk that at that one spot. So I wrote, wrote that down and, and knew you guys had that available to you. If you were doing something other than an alpha particle, then that would be a different mass, okay? So for instance, for an electron, what would that mass be? Instead of the 3,727, if you want the rest of, mass of an electron, The mass would be four magnitudes smaller. Would it be like 0.51 MeV per C squared? Yep, the 0.511 MeV per C squared. And you would use that 0.5 because the energy of this electron is already in MeV, okay? If you had the energy of the electron in KeV, then you could use the 511 KeV, okay? so. The important thing with the MC squared, the rest mass in MeV, and the kinetic energy is that their units match. Doesn't matter what the energy units are, or mass units are, but the units need to match. So what would you get here for the relativistic velocity? 
and the fraction of the speed of light for a 7.6868 MeV electron. It'd be 99.8% of the speed of light. That's it. So that's definitely relativistic, right? I have a question about that. Yeah. So how does, how does the velocity, I suppose, differ from the Newtonian velocity due to relativity? When you get closer and closer to the speed of light, you can't go over the speed of light, agreed? At least theoretically. So when you keep putting energy into that electron, you're not really increasing its velocity anymore. What you're doing in effect, this is where like relativity and quantum stuff gets weird, is you're increasing the mass of the electron. So that's why it, the electrons can never move faster than the speed of light if you give them enough energy where classically it seems like they would, they can't go faster. So where does that all, all that energy go? Well, it gets converted into mass basically, depending on how you think about those energy mass conversions. That makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this electron is moving pretty fast. The final equation for this slide, I'm not gonna ask you to calculate anything with it right now. You do see it sometimes in different equations. This is the term known as the Lorentz factor. So it's shown as a gamma. And the only other thing there, I wanted to spell this out a little bit more on the slide, um, but there is a shortcut here you can use if you already know it, which recall that that V over C, the relativistic velocity over the speed of light, that's equal to this beta term or the fraction of the speed of light. So where you see that V over C, if you know beta, you can just plug in beta instead. And a lot of times in textbooks, they do indeed reduce that to just the beta. So when we look at these particles moving, when we look at how, when we imagine ourselves as a particle, as a charged particle moving through matter, interacting with electrons, creating ion pairs, losing energy through those interactions, what we wanna be able to do is we wanna be able to calculate how much energy is lost per unit distance. And we call this the linear rate of energy loss. That's this negative DE dx. And really the negative sign is just put with the differential rather than keeping it on the right side to make it a little bit easier to understand and work through. We know this is gonna be the energy lost per interaction. Now, when you look at this equation, it also has a different name. Besides calling it the linear rate of energy loss, we also sometimes call it stopping power. So what's the stopping power for a material with a given unit or particle of radiation? And the higher the stopping power, the shorter the distance that particle is gonna move through the material. So the coefficient here is a little confusing um, and some of the terms are a little bit confusing. The betas are in here. Recall that the betas are the fraction of the speed of light that the particle is moving at. In the coefficient term, the Z is the charge of the charged particle. The E is the um, fundamental charge, which a lot of people wanna jump and think about using the 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. The weird thing here is that the units kind of get confusing with this particular equation. My next slide, the units are gonna be a little bit more straightforward. So 
slightly different, it's a variation on this equation. But because of the units here, because we're typically using CGS units, centigram, uh, centimeters, grams, and seconds, the E, the fundamental unit of charge here, is actually expressed as what's called a stat coulomb. And this is the unit of charge in CGS units, and that's this 4.8 times 10 to the negative 10th. So we want to use that for that E, that's a constant, okay? The N is the target electron density. When you think about target electron density, that's really going to be basically the number of atoms per volume, which you're going to find using the mass of the material and the molar mass of the material and its density. And the number of atoms per unit volume times the number of electrons associated with that atom. So this is for the stopping material, okay? And that's the N term, the lowercase n. The mc squared and all, all of those are going to be the electron rest masses expressed in MeV. Or no, sorry, wait. Expressed in, yeah, the M is the mass of the electron expressed in grams, since we're in CGS units. And the speed of light, the C then would be 2.998 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second. And then there's one other term in this equation, and that's this I, and this is the ionization or mean excitation energy for the material. So how much energy does it take to ionize an atom in the material? We've got some equations at the bottom there with that, that third bullet. Um, if you're just looking at hydrogen, which is almost never going to be the case, but if you were looking at hydrogen as being your stopping medium, it would be 19 electron volts. If you're looking at anything between helium and aluminum, then you use this 11.2 plus 11.7 times the atomic number to get this ionization energy or mean excitation energy. And for any element higher than aluminum, so this would be things like lead or iron, that's when you use the 52.8 plus 8.71 times the atomic number. And you're gonna have some practice in a two or three minutes with this equation or the other one. For now, conceptually without doing any math, for a non-relativistic particle, so let's say beta is small enough that we're gonna pretty much ignore it in the subtraction term. We can't really ignore it within the natural log. But let's say that beta is small enough that the beta squared is effectively zero in this end part. Or that it doesn't really impact the energy of the particle. How could you increase the stopping power of the material? for a given particle. So let's say we've got a non-relativistic alpha particle. What could you do to make that alpha particle lose more energy per unit distance? Raise the Raise. N. Raise the N. How could you do that? Just by using like a, either a, a more dense, target, I guess. Mm -hmm. So the higher the density, generally the higher the stopping power is going to be. What would the, what typically, what kinds of materials typically give you higher densities? Metal. Metals with like higher atomic numbers, right? So not only are you going to have a higher mass density, but you would then also have a higher number of electrons per atom. So going to a high Z material, going to a dense material. So if you've got two materials that are both high Z or relatively high Z, the one with higher density is going to be your better choice. 
for stopping power, for increasing this, okay? Now, some of the units with this particular expression are a little bit confusing. I've made plenty of mistakes myself trying to use this equation. There is a variation on this equation called the beta block equation, where a lot of those constants get rolled into one constant. This is the 0 0.3071. The nice thing with this constant is it's already expressed in MEV. So you don't have to do any kinds of conversions. You don't have to use a weird value for the fundamental unit of charge using stat coulombs instead of coulombs. Instead of trying to calculate N or the electron density of the stopping material separately, it gets included right here as part of this coefficient. So the rho, is the density of the stopping medium. The capital Z here is the atomic number of the stopping medium. Whereas the capital Z over here was the atomic number of the charged particle or the charge of the charged particle, okay? So what the Z means changes between these two equations. The Q squared, the Q now is the charge on the charged particle. The A is the mass number of the material or average molar mass. All of the other terms pretty much still mean the same thing they did on the prior equation. So the beta is still the fraction of the speed of light. The I is still this mean ionization potential. We do have two new terms here, there's this delta over two, which is a shielding correction for high energy ions. We're generally going to ignore that term. The C over Z is a low energy correction. We're also generally going to ignore that term when we use this for calculations. These corrections are empirical. And it's not so much a new term, but it's new in this equation. The delta E max goes back to that equ equation slide with collisions. And this is the maximum amount of energy that can be transferred per collision between the particle and the electron, okay? It's um, dependent upon the mass and the energy of the incident particle, as well as the mass of the electron. Overall, I think this equation ends up being a little bit easier to apply than the first one I showed you. And then in Loveland, he likes slightly different expressions for the mean ionization potential. You still get about the same numbers for these two expressions, but you would use this 12 plus, Z over, 12 plus 7 over Z for atomic numbers less than 13. And the key is that's the ionization potential per Z, per atomic number. So once you do, let's say you're doing aluminum, which is not aluminum, let's say you're doing um, nitrogen, no, it's next to aluminum, silicon, right? Let's say you're doing silicon, atomic number 14, then you'd have 12 plus seven over 14, that's one half, so you get 12 and a half, that's 12 and a half EV per atomic number. So you'd still have to multiply that 12 and a half by the 14 for the silicon, okay? Um, and then there's that weird expression with the Z to the negative 1.19 in the bottom. If you did silicon, wouldn't you have to use the second one since Z is greater than 13? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I was trying to come up with an easy number that would make that fraction easy in my head. Could have done nitrogen, I guess. That would have been seven over seven. So the next slide is gonna summarize both of these. And what I'd like you to do is flip a coin. Hopefully you've got a coin or something nearby that you can flip. Don't flip your phones. And if you get heads, I would like for you to use the first equation for calculating stopping power. And if you get tails, I would like for you to use the second equation to calculate stopping power.
So remember the first equation, your units should be in centigram, centimeters, grams, and seconds. And I can give you the um, ergs to MeV conversion if you need that again. The equations are here again for these mean ionization potentials. Go ahead and calculate with that, calculate that for with both of those equations, and then we'll compare the two values that we get for stopping power. And that's going to take a couple minutes, probably. If you need one of those values, again, let me know. If you need the MEV ERG one, let me know. You guys have these slides as well from Canvas. Uh, when you've got your stopping power answer, Go ahead and type it into the chat, but just send it to me so I know you've got it done. Do you I know what question. density of aluminum is? Uh, yeah, uh, this one is one you're probably gonna wanna memorize. It is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Also, is the Q term the charge of the particle? Yes, in the beta block equation, the Q is the charge on the particle. And the Z is the... atomic number of the stopping material. So is Q the charge number or charge in coulombs? It's the charge number, yeah the integer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. That's why that second equation is a lot nicer. How do we shift the electron rest mass from megavolt or mega electron volts per c squared to? Uh, don't uh, use the yeah. Don't use the mc squared with the five eleven. Uh, use the mass of an electron as nine point one one times ten to the negative twenty eighth grams, and then go ahead and multiply the c for the speed of light would be. 2.998 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second. For finding beta, what do we use for mc squared? Um, if you are doing the beta with that v over c equals the square root equation, the MC squared's there. You just have to match the energy, the kinetic energy. So the MC squared's would be the 0 0.511 if it's an electron, or in this case for the alpha, it would be that mass, um, the rest mass that Cody gave you guys for the Q calculations, the 3,727.3794. MeV per C squared per alpha.
So for the delta E in the second equation, um, we're using that formula give us early on. So like the energy would be just the 7.6868. That would be the energy. And it, it's approximate. You want to calculate what it really is, but you should get about one five hundredth of that MeV can be transferred per collision. So the Q in the uh, second equation, um, that's the charge of the particle that's moving through the material, not the stopping material itself. Okay. And for an alpha particle, yeah, that would be positive too. Now the second part of your question kind of hits at the idea that as that alpha particle slows down, its Q is going to change, right? As it picks up electrons. What's the target electron density for aluminum? The N term? Yes. What did you get for it? Or are you, you're trying to check your value? Oh, is it a calculation? The N, yeah. So um, it's basically just kind of like a stoichiometry thing using the number of electrons per atom, the density, the molar mass, and Avogadro's number. So you end up getting electrons per cubic centimeter. Um, Logan's, maybe I have a typo. Logan's looks a little bit low. Oh wait, that's in electrons per centimeter. Should we be getting a negative value? Uh, none of these should be negative overall, no. Good. Good. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Logan's looks a little bit high. And if you don't quite get the same answers I have, we can look over these during office hours and try to spot mistakes. The first equation especially is awfully confusing with the units. But the second equation kind of obfuscates some of the mechanisms by combining everything into that 0 0.3071 term, so. Oh no, sorry, actually Logan's, uh, the value itself, the number looked high, but your magnitude is off a little bit. So it's actually very low compared to what it should be. The, in the Emacs equation, the capital M is the, the heavier particle. It's the particle that's moving through the material. And the E is the energy of that particle. So the capital M for an alpha would be the 3,727 
0.3794 MeV. Would the big E then be 7.6868? Yeah, that would be the big E. Or the kinetic energy in the beta equation, the V equation. And in the delta E max equation, you can actually use whatever units you want for mass as long as the units match. So if you want to use the 9.11, or if you want to use AMU, you can. Yeah, beta is about 0 0.064. Should the electron density be to the 23rd power or no? Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yep. Electrons per cubic centimeter. Because you're thinking about a mole's worth of material, basically. So, um, A uh, Laurel, yes. I think when you do that conversion, I think that'll get you there. So your first answer you typed out right now is in the ergs, the energy unit in CGS. Keras, that one is awfully high. I will show mine once people report their answers back, so. Hanalei, that's pretty close. That's about twice, I think, what it should be. Laurel's also looks a little bit high, but they're on the right order of magnitude. Hunter's is also a little high, but on the right order of magnitude. So when I show my work, you can help me find if I made a mistake, or you can compare your own work to mine. Logan's looks like a, the right order of magnitude, but it also looks a little bit high. The negative, I'm trying to think about where that could be coming in. Yeah, I'll capture this one, just like I did for yesterday's stuff too. I think the negative came from the natural log of, of whatever it was. Like I got a really small fraction. Mm -hmm. so, uh... um, maybe check when you do that, maybe check the, um, the MC squared. Was that the first equation or the second equation, Michael, with the negative? That was the first one. So in that one, just make sure your mass unit for the electron, make sure it's um, in the grams. So 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. And that C is 2.998 times 10 to the 10th, which gets squared. So When you take the natural log of that term, it should definitely come out positive. So for the, go ahead. For the I, if it's in electron volts, how are we getting that to stack coulombs or what we need to? Um, for the I in the EV within the, um,
It's a good question. Um, for the I, you don't have to change that. Just leave it in electron volts? Because you've got, um, yeah, why is that? I guess could we, do we use just like MC squared as 0 0.511 in the, the numerator and then cancel the units out? Yes, that's okay. what I did in the natural log. Sorry, yeah, this is where it's confusing. So okay. the MC squared in the front factor, that's where the M needs to be grams and the C needs to be centimeters per second. But inside of the natural log, that MC squared, that can be your 511,000 EV. That's how it'll work out. Cause then your EV in the numerator and your EV in the denominator cancel. So like when you take the natural log, it's only supposed to be of a unitless number. So let me show you my work for this and you can compare. The only thing really that's different here is that I went ahead and I separated out the one minus beta squared. Sometimes that's written out like this and sometimes it's kept in the fraction in the denominator. It doesn't make a big difference. It shouldn't make a big difference in the answer. Mathematically, it should still be the same. So like with the first equation, N is kind of the tricky part to find. So I've got the 13 electrons per atom, the density, the molar mass of the aluminum, and Avogadro's number, and that all cancels to give electrons per cubic centimeter. The mean ionization potential or mean excitation potential, I get about 163 electron volts per ion pair. The MC squared here is where you want to use the 511,000 EV for the electron. So that cancels with the EV for the ionization potential. Our betas are all going to be the 0 0.0641 from earlier. The Z here is two, because it's an alpha particle. The E is this 4.8 times 10 to the negative 10th. This MC squared, this is the 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28th grams. And this C is the 2.998 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second. And the beta, remember, is just a fraction. It's a ratio. So the units here for the beta don't matter, because it's just a fraction of the speed of light. So doing all that, I've got some notes here for the values that I found. So this would be the coefficient. This is everything in front of the brackets for the first equation. And after taking the natural logs and doing the subtractions within the brackets, this is what I got. And then this is the conversion between ergs and MeV. So I get about 1260 MeV per centimeter. What is the conversion for ergs? That's this uh, 1.6 times 10 to the negative sixth ergs per MeV. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because the units up here in the front are centimeters, grams, seconds to get everything to cancel. And we like the centimeters, grams, seconds because of the volumes in cubic centimeters. Otherwise, then you got to go through all your other conversions for the volumes with cubic meters. The second equation, the coefficient is going to change. That's the 0 0.3071 times the density of the aluminum. That is still the same value. Times the atomic number of the aluminum. That's the 13. That's where that comes in. Times the 2 squared, which is the charge on the alpha particle. 
but in the second equation, we don't, we're not thinking of that as, or we're not representing that as Z, we're representing that as Q. We divide by the molar mass of the aluminum, the atomic number, that's this 26.98, that's the A. We still divide by the beta squared, that's still the same, the 0 0.064. Inside of the terms, we have our delta E max, the maximum energy that can be transferred. That is about, I didn't write the value down, unfortunately, but that's about 1 500th of the 7.6868. The ionization, the mean excitation potential, has a slightly different expression for it, but we still get about 163 electron volts per ion pair. And so is it only for the uh, first constant term in CGS that you use Z equals two? Yes. In the second equation, the Q is two, but the Z is the atomic number of the stopping material. So all these units, all these numbers, like the electrons per atom, the density, the molar mass, the um, atomic number, these all get worked into these equations in some way. It's just expressed a slightly different way. Going through this equation, the second equation, I got 1264 MeV per centimeter. Notice how close that is to the first one. So it doesn't really matter which equation we use. The second one seems to be a little bit easier to apply, and that's the one I'm going to recommend that you use going forward if you do have to do calculations. To kind of wrap this up before we take a break, looking at the second equation, but thinking about our original question of how could you increase stopping power? So don't worry about what you can or can't change necessarily anymore, but think in terms of just in general, what kinds of stopping materials, what kinds of particles are going to have the highest stopping powers? And how can you figure that out from the, the coefficient terms? Are you asking how to increase it? Yeah. What would Just give you the highest? A heavier element. A heavier yeah. stopping material, rather. Well, heavier would be the molar mass, though, right? Is that yes. what you Yes. Well, I more so meant Z. OK. So yeah, a higher atomic number would definitely give you a higher stopping power. Would just a heavier element give you a higher stopping power necessarily? Ira's shaking his head no, because that's in the denominator, right? So higher mass, higher molar mass would make it go down. So heavier elements just on their own aren't necessarily going to be great for stopping power unless their atomic number is also going up. Then that just might be a wash. What else did we say sometimes goes up when you go to heavier elements? Sometimes, but not all the time. The density? The density. So higher density is going to give you a higher stopping power. What else could you do, not necessarily to the stopping material, but what else would give you a high stopping power in terms of combinations of things? Something with a lower relativistic velocity? Yeah, so the slower something is moving, the higher its stopping power is going to be, or the higher its linear rate of energy loss is going to be, okay? Because remember, the two things are really the same thing, just we have different names. We tend to think about stopping power for a material that's going to stop the radiation, but the radiation itself has the linear rate of energy loss. 
So absolutely, slower particles are going to lose energy faster. And the Q up here, you don't have a lot of control over this once the particles are created, or even a lot of fine control over this for particular particles, but the charge on the ion, the higher the charge on the ion, the higher its linear rate of energy loss is going to be. So if you have an alpha particle that's completely stripped of electrons versus an alpha particle that still has one electron with it, then it's not really an alpha particle anymore. Those two particles are going to have different rates of energy loss. Is it possible for the alpha particle to become more highly charged? Or are there any other particles that can have a higher charge? For alpha, remember, it would just go up to two plus maximum. Right. But if you're thinking about something like an oxygen ion, an oxygen ion could gain or lose anywhere up to eight electrons. And so it's got a whole range of possible charges. So in effect, what this means is that as that particle is moving through the material, it's going to be losing energy. So its speed is going to be changing, right? It's relativistic speed, it's relative speed to the speed of light. As its speed is changing, as it's slowing down, it also has the chance to pick up more electrons. So its Q is going to change, okay? And that's why these linear rate of energy losses are expressed as differential equations. We're not going to do any solutions with those or anything. Just pointing out that this is only going to be true for a given set of values. As soon as that particle starts to lose energy, its linear rate of energy loss is going to change. So these are instantaneous values when we find them. And this is a good spot to take a break. So come back around 1, 1 20. Go ahead and take 11 minutes. So after the break, let me switch back to, to the slide. So after the break, now we've got um, these two equations. The main one for a linear rate of energy loss, the beta Blanc equation. They are differentials, they are instantaneous. Um, you could integrate them, they uh, get pretty messy. So what we do instead with these to kind of figure out an overall range. So how much energy does the particle have? How much is it gonna lose? How far can it go in a stopping medium? What we do is we split the differential into terms based on the particle and the stopping medium. And so we split these two up. And so that this function, this g of z, is a function or a term that's going to depend on the stopping medium. Everything else is going to be based off of the particle. And from earlier, I showed you the equation there for the Lorentz factor. That Lorentz factor shows up here again. This is the gamma squared. And the v squared is the relativistic velocity. The m and the Q and the E in this coefficient are all, again, terms relating to the particle. So it's the charge on the particle, it's the mass of the particle, it's the, or sorry, yeah. Now, the M is the mass of the electron, and the E is the energy of the particle. So in general, looking at this equation, if we kind of regroup our terms like this, how does stopping power depend on the incident ion? Well, it depends on the charge. The higher the charge of the ion, the higher the stopping power. And the higher the energy of the particle, the lower the stopping power. But the higher the speed of the particle, the higher the stopping power. So that's kind of a little bit weird because you've got speed versus energy. They're proportional. Um, you would take this equation and you would integrate from the initial kinetic energy to zero to find the range. But in practice, instead of going through and doing the integral of this, we create tables or figures. We can create a table or a figure for several particles in one specific material. So you can see a figure where there's a lot of different particles in aluminum and what's their range. 
or you might see a figure or a table for one particular particle, but in a lot of different materials. And so that's typical for like alpha particles, where they will show you the range for an alpha particle in different materials. These ranges are given as aerial densities. So grams or milligrams per square centimeter. So the aluminum I mentioned is used a lot, 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. That would be 2,700 milligrams per cubic centimeter for its density. And because the ranges are typically reported as aerial densities, we use the actual volumetric density to convert between an aerial range and a true thickness, linear thickness, okay? And so you can also study particles. You can um, do experiments in the lab to look at the energy remaining with a particle. And here's an example for an argon-40 projectile being shot through beryllium metal. Beryllium is very lightweight, which is great because you can make it very thin and it's still kind of strong for being used on windows for detectors. So some detector windows are made from this because you can make it very thin and you're gonna have not a lot of energy loss to that window of the detector. So the x-axis on this graph is the distance is in milligrams per square centimeter. Notice that's an aerial range or an aerial density. MeV on the left axis is basically the energy remaining for the particle. How much energy does it still have the further it moves through the material? So you could generate this by using different thicknesses of materials and measuring the amount of energy remaining with the particle. The right axis, which is where this DEDX is plotted, this is showing you how much energy is lost per, or how much energy is lost um, in centimeters squared, MeV centimeters squared per gram. So again, this is also going to depend on the density of the material. What you see here, this is for argon-40 particles, so they're heavy, they're highly charged, okay? They are um, depositing almost all of their energy in a very, very small thickness of the material. This peak here, this energy loss, this linear rate of energy loss, or the stopping power peak here that you get at the end of the particle track, this is commonly called the Bragg peak. This has a big impact, a big influence on how radiation interacts within living tissues. So if you had a beam of particles coming from outside of a person's body, you dial in the energy of that beam so that those particles deposit almost all of their energy over a very small thickness of material. So if you're trying to target a tumor and a, a patient and a person, you want that radiation beam to deposit all of its energy or almost all of its energy in the tumor and nowhere else in the patient, okay? The stopping power here, this is a very sharp peak because we're talking about a heavy ion in a solid material, okay? If we look for the same kind of thing, if we look for this energy lost per length, this linear rate of energy loss or this ionization density, density, so this now is the number of ions formed, which if it takes the same amount of energy to form an ion, then the more ions you form, the more energy you've lost. And we see the same general shape. This is for an alpha particle. So the particle is lighter now, has less charge, and it's moving through air, which is a lot less dense. And so this also now is a more traditional thickness, a linear thickness in centimeters. Because it's air, because it's less dense, because it's an alpha particle, the Bragg peak here is not as sharp but we do still see the same general behavior where there's a lower rate, linear rate of energy loss in the beginning, and we see that it peaks at some specific distance. So when we wanna think about ranges of particles and how far they actually move, 
we tend to create graphs rather than trying to solve the differential equations. So here's a graph in silicon. Any ideas why you might be interested in how far particles would move in silicon? What do we use silicon for? Computers. Computers. Chips. Computer chips because silicon is a what? Semiconductor. Semiconductor, okay. And so there are detectors that are semiconductor detectors that are based on silicon. So knowing how far things can move in silicon is gonna be important for being able to determine whether a silicon detector will be able to detect a particular type of particle radiation. So we have a range here on the y-axis. This is a linear range in micrometers. We have our particle energy in MeV on the x-axis. And we've got protons, deuterons, tritons. We've got helium-3 and alphas. So notice this is one type of material where we've shown multiple different particles interacting. Okay, This is the total particle energy, not energy per nucleon or anything like that. So this is kind of on a log-log plot. Notice that it basically follows an exponential format with pretty much the same exponent for all ions. Notice that protons are going to be able to travel the furthest in silicon because they're gonna have the lowest stopping power because they're the lightest particle, they have the least charge out of heavy charged particles, okay? If you wanted to know the range of a 20 MeV alpha particle, you would find 20 MeVs on this graph. You would find where that is on the y-axis. Could be straighter, it's not too bad and you would come across to read. Is that one, two, six, eight? Not quite sure how to read all the lines here. I'm gonna go ahead and say that's like about 210 micrometers, maybe 220, okay? If you wanted to know the range of a 10 MeV alpha particle, you do the same thing. You're basically just trying to read the graph. So for any questions where you have to read the graph, there's gonna be a range of accepted values. It's not gonna be, you can't get super precise numbers off of these graphs for the ranges. The equation that's on this slide is how you can use this information to find the range of a second particle. So let's say you know the range of a 20 MeV alpha particle. And this is where I'd like to have a better mouse for this, but let me pause the slideshow. Now I've come out of it and just type it. Screen sharing stopped. Boom. Let's say we know the, the range of a 20 MeV alpha and we said that was about 210 220 micrometers and i'm going to cheat and use a u there if we know the range of a particle and we're looking for the range of another particle that's not on our chart or our table or our graph this equation is the one that lets us find the new range of the new particle r1 m1 and E1, if it was here, it's not in here, would be for the first particle, the particle that you know on the table or the graph. So M1 for this alpha particle would be for AMU, okay? Just about. The range one is the range of this alpha particle, and that's 220, okay? but that would only be for the first energy. 
the energy of the alpha particle. What we're actually going to do is we're going to look up the range of the alpha particle for the new energy of the new particle. So if we wanted to do, let's say, oxygen, if we want to do oxygen 16, the alpha particle M1 over 16 for oxygen, that's going to give me one fourth, right? This fraction here. Let's say I want to know the range of a 20 MeV oxygen so that E2 is going to be my 20 MeV. Well, 20 times 1 fourth is going to be 5. So I'm going to look for the range of my alpha particle at 5 MeV. And I don't have my pen anymore here. So that looks like it's about 23 micrometers or so. OK. So that's going to be this R1 of E2 times M1 over M2. So that's the range of an alpha particle that was 5 MeV. Then we take that range and we correct it using the mass and the charge of the new particle, the oxygen. So the charge on the alpha would have been 2. 2 squared is 4. Charge on the oxygen might have been 6. Let's just say it's completely ionized, and so it's 8. So that's 64. So 4 over 64 is 1 over 16. OK. And the oxygen mass is 16 over the alpha mass of 1. So that fraction gives us 4. So we've got 4 times 1 over 16, which gives us 1 fourth. So the range of this oxygen particle is going to be 1 fourth of this R1 that we just found. And I know that's very oral. So let me type it up in here. So the R1 of the function is going to give us about, say, 23 micrometers here. And then we take that and we multiply by our 1 fourth from the m's and the q's. And we get what? Basically just under 6 micrometers. So a 20 MeV alpha particle can go 220 micrometers in silicon. A 20 MeV oxygen 16 ion would only be able to go about 6 micrometers in silicon. Let me pause in case there's any questions. Did you say that the M1 of the alpha was a mass four? I mean, mass one? Mass four? Yeah, I thought, yeah, that's what I thought, but I thought you said M1 was one for a second, so I was a little confused. I should have said four. So M2 would be 16, M1 would be four. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So that's in a given material, and that's with different particles. If you have a different particle that you're trying to find the range for, you do want to find the most similar particle to have the smallest uncertainty in your range determination. Okay. Of course, again, we're trying to read everything off the graph, so we're not going to get as much from it as we could from solving the differentials. You can also plot in a given material. Again, we can show different particles here. Here's the alpha and the proton. In this case, the energy axis, the x-axis, is kind of corrected per nucleon. So if you take the energy of the alpha and divide by 4, notice that the alpha and the proton are basically completely matched up over almost this whole domain. The times 10 to the negative 1 that you see on the right side there means that you would read the range off the y-axis, but it's been moved down. So to get the real range, you would move it back up by multiplying by 10. So if you're looking for the energy or the range of a 10 MeV proton, and you're looking on this graph, and it's got tick marks on the right side too, and you say that looks like about um, 15 milligrams per square centimeter since it's logarithmic, maybe 16. Recall that you actually have to multiply that by 10. So that would actually be really 160 
or so milligrams per square centimeter. Again, as an aerial range, okay? So why do the alpha and the proton deviate a little bit? You see here on the right side that there's this nice big equal speeds, equal, equal ranges. Right, so if we take the energy and divide by four, that's basically saying for equal speed particles, they have the same range in aluminum. So why do they separate at lower speeds? What happens to charged particles when they slow down? They start interacting with other charged particles. And be more specific, what kind of interaction in, in specifically is going to happen with the alpha particle that can't really happen with the proton? Columbic attraction between electrons and the protons? Take that one more step. If they're attracted, they might actually... Ionize? Or combine. So recall that at velocities comparable to the K-shell electrons, the inside electrons, inner shell, the ions are gonna to start to pick up electrons. So the proton, if it picks up an electron, now it's no longer charged, right? Now it's not gonna interact the same way anymore. Whereas the alpha particle could pick up an electron and it's still going to be charged. And it's that shift there where some of those alpha particles are gonna to start to pick up electrons. It's that shift that affects the range of the alpha particles. When they get a lower charge, they effecti effectively have a lower stopping power, which means they can travel further in the material. So that's why we see this big branch point here, where all of a sudden at low energies now, alpha particles are gonna have a greater range than protons, okay? And here again is aluminum, but now this is a lot of different ions. So we've got helium, beryllium, carbon, et cetera on here. And again, you would pick one of these and look at it to try to figure out what the range was if you were trying to look for something different. So here's a couple of examples for how we can use these graphs. So what is the range of a 120 MeV nitrogen 14 ion in aluminum? So 120 MeV, Nitrogen 14 ion in aluminum. We would use the equation that was on that earlier graph. We would want to use the carbon 14 range because that's going to be the closest to the nitrogen 14. So if you go back and you look at um, the carbon 12, I don't know why I'm saying, I had carbon dating on the mind when I was writing all this. So if you go back to the slide that had the helium, the beryllium, the carbon on there, the uranium, all these other elements, and I'll show it real quick, but I want to stay on the uh, want to stay on the handwritten notes. Really, you come to that slide. You want to look at the carbon twelve line. What you see on that carbon twelve line is that you can see I did the right mass here for the carbon and the mass of the nitrogen. Take the mass of your known particle over the mass of the particle you're trying to find the range of, so 12 over 14. Multiply by the energy of the particle you're trying to find the range of, so that's the 120 MeV nitrogen. So I got like 103 over 14, 103 MeV here. To use this graph, because it says it's the energy of the ion in MeV per AMU, I'm going to divide that by 14 and get 7.3 MeV per AMU. Okay. So I use that graph, and I look up the range of carbon-12 
for 7.3 MeV per AMU. And the range I estimated for that was about 35 milligrams per square centimeter. And I would say for a graph like this, for that line, that's probably plus or minus two. So anything between 33 and 37 would be reasonable for that. Now that's everything here behind the R1. So now we take that and we multiply by the charge of carbon over the charge of nitrogen squared. And we multiply by the mass of nitrogen over the mass of carbon. So I find for my nitrogen 14, my 120 MeV nitrogen 14, that it can go 30 milligrams per square centimeter. If we're worried about significant figures, I guess I would say the zero there is significant, but again, these ranges are read from a graph, and so there's not a whole lot of precision in these. How does this compare to the energy for say a carbon 12 that's going this fast? Well, you would take this times 12, And I get, I'm just gonna round and call that 88 MeV total. And if you looked at an 88 MeV carbon 12, wait, that doesn't really make sense. That's not what I wanted to do. 120 MeV for carbon 12 would be 10 MeV per nucleon. 10 MeV per nucleon for carbon 12 looks like about say 55 or so. for my range, just to kind of compare. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so would the Q value, is that just the number of protons? Yeah, think of that as the charge on the ion, which generally would be the atomic number. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So still looking at those example questions, we could use this graph or we could, the one before is really gonna be the better one to look at. What thickness of aluminum will reduce the energy of a 40 MeV helium-4 beam to 32 MeV? So we wanna put something into our beam that gives us a clean alpha beam of 32 MeV total. So I would suggest that you go back to this slide, these graphs for this. These are gonna give us the most precise information for the alpha particle. So 40 MeV alpha, that's got four nucleons. So we're gonna divide the 40 by four to get 10. So that's our starting energy of our beam. And we wanna put something inside in that, in that beam path that's gonna reduce that energy of the beam to 32 MeV total or eight MeV per nucleon. So this is just, as easy as looking at the graph and finding the range for those two energies. So at the 10, I think I went a little bit higher here in this example, at the 10 MeV per nucleon, I would say that alpha particle has a range of 180 milligrams per square centimeter. The eight MeV per nucleon alpha is gonna have a range more like 95 milligrams per square centimeter. So the difference between those two is 85 milligrams per square centimeter. So that's the thickness that we're gonna wanna put in here into our beam. Let me double check the question. And that's it. That would be the answer, the 85, okay. Now, if you really wanted to know a physical thickness, again, you would take the 85 milligrams per square centimeter 
you would divide by the density of the stopping material, which in this case was aluminum. So 85 divided by 2,700 milligrams per cubic centimeter. And that would give you the actual thickness, the physical thickness, rather than the, the aerial thickness. If it's not specified what units, then the milligrams per square centimeter is okay. If I say a physical thickness or a linear thickness, then that's when you want to go just to centimeters. It's kind of a two-part question here. What energy loss will a 20 MeV deuteron beam suffer when passing through the same material? So you go back to your graph. 20 MeV deuteron. If it's a deuteron, it's only two particles. So 20 divided by two gives us 10 still, okay. Um, it passes through 85 milligrams per square centimeter. So the range of the 20 MeV deuteron was still 180 milligrams per square centimeter. Am I still sharing the right page? Yeah, I am, okay. I'm just not alt tabbing to it. There we go. Um, so, sorry, I'm losing my window. That deuteron, that deuteron still has the same range of 180 milligrams per square centimeter. If it passes through 85 milligrams per square centimeter, then that means it still has an effective range of 95 milligrams per square centimeter. So for the deuteron, you look up what the energy would be for the 95, that's still the 8 MeV per nucleon. The 8 MeV per nucleon times the two nucleons for the deuteron gives you 16 MeV, okay? It started at 20 MeV, it ends at 16 MeV, so it lost 4 MeV. So notice that where this curve is straight, the amount, total amount of energy lost per nucleon is gonna be the same no matter what, um, what the thickness is, what the material is. So the alpha particle here lost two MeV per nucleon. The deuteron here lost two MeV per nucleon, right? All right, and the final example, what is the range of a two MeV per nucleon gold ion in aluminum? So I would suggest, again, you go to the, the plot with all of the different ions in the aluminum and that you work from there. So two MeV per nucleon, so two MeV per nucleon, that means that we're looking for something that is um, I didn't write it down. 1,970 MeV. That's pretty high, okay. Um, we know it's two MeV per nucleon, so we look on the graph. We want to apply our range equation. That's this equation up here. Okay, that's what we're applying now for the gold. Now you've got a choice here. You could use the xenon, you could use the uranium. You generally want to pick the one that has the closest mass number. I think I went with the uranium here. Yeah. Try to do this for a much higher energy gold originally, and then I changed it to the two. Um, you take the two MeV per nucleon, you take that as your E2, you multiply that by the mass of the uranium over the mass of the gold. Okay, so that gives me, and then you look up the range. 
That gave me 9.665 milligrams per square centimeter. Maybe I wasn't using this chart for that. I don't know. Where did I get that from? That seems awfully precise. Um, that range, that's the R1 now that you multiply by your, is that right? I see. Um, why did I do that? 26. It's the old one. Two. Yeah. Sorry. Just under 10, that's the range you look up, multiply by the Q squared over the other Q squared, mass two over mass one, and that gives me a corrected range for this gold of about 11 milligrams per square centimeter. Should have rewritten this one. I'll rewrite it before I take the picture. To post. So from this so far, really the things to know are how you read the graphs and how do you use the graphs to approximate ranges for different particles that are not on the graphs. What are the important factors that influence the linear rate of energy loss in the beta block equation? And how would you find certain things like the mean ionization potential? And how do these heavy charged particles generally interact within matter? Now, a lot of what we did today, we're gonna to build on tomorrow. And we can use a lot of this with the heavy charged particles as the starting point for other things. What I would suggest you look at before tomorrow is the exercises. These two questions that go with the slide so far up to this point, okay? If you're looking for other stuff to practice, Anything from Loveland chapter 16 would be good. But these two exercises are also good ones for thinking about what you might see on the exam. So I will stop the recording here.